Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm State Representative Michael Howard and the author of the Alex Smith Emergency Insulin Act. Uh, we need to approach the crisis of insulin affordability as if the lives of Minnesotans hang in the balance because that is the truth. Every day, Minnesotans with diabetes are in a fight for their life to afford the insulin they need to survive. Uh, Senator Wickler and I have been working on this issue now for more than a year, and it is time for action. Over the last 30 days, a working group has been meeting, uh, and since that time, we've learned another Minnesotan has lost their life, rationing their insulin. On a nearly daily basis, we see tweets and Facebook posts uh, from folks with diabetes pleading uh, for someone to help them. They're down to their last drop of insulin and they need support. Just this morning, I received an email from an emergency room nurse who says on a regular basis, she treats patients for DKA and when she talks with them about why they're there, it's because they can't afford their insulin. This is a crisis and we need to forge ahead urgently to reach a solution. And the good news is the meetings uh, that we have been having over the last month, they show us a path forward. Uh, there are good ideas in the House DFL proposal. There are good ideas in the Senate GOP proposal. We really should be able to merge these two ideas and pass a strong bill on insulin affordability. That said, the pace of the conversation in those closed door meetings are not moving fast enough. And we're not capturing the voices of Minnesotans who are most impacted uh, by this on a daily basis. And meanwhile, Minnesotans are waiting and waiting and waiting and they literally can't afford to wait any longer. Uh, that's why that we agree with Governor Walls that we should hold public hearings and include the voices of Minnesotans with diabetes and work urgently to get this done. Uh, and also to move the ball forward, on Friday, Democrats did present a framework to the Senate. Uh, we believe it's a reasonable compromise that blends the two proposals and meets the four objectives that we all uh, set out on that working group and agreed to which were, we need an emergency access program. We need a long-term insulin affordability program. We need insulin manufacturers to pay for this program, and we need to do this as quickly as we can. You know, our proposal would uh, make sure that Minnesotans in crisis could enter their pharmacy and secure a supply of insulin that day. But we would also ensure that a navigator follows up with that patient and connects them to long-term resources. We would insist that insulin manufacturers uh, pay for this program. And as soon as we pass a bill, that's when we can start setting things up. I mean, I think that's the biggest impediment to setting something up quickly is legislative action. Uh, so from our perspective, this solution is staring us right in the face and it's time to call the question in front of Minnesotans, uh, where do you stand? If Senate Republicans have problems with the approach, this approach, what are they? Uh, let's work together, have the discussion, do it earnestly and urgently because the clock is ticking. Uh, so at this last meeting, Republicans requested time to review the proposal, and it's our hope that we would hear back very soon uh, from the Senate Republicans and we can continue to meet and talk, to negotiate, to hear from the public, to work, to uh, get this done because lives are on the line. And lastly, I just want to thank the Minnesotans with diabetes that continue to raise their voice and push for action. It's those Minnesotans that have driven us to this point. Closed door meetings haven't amongst legislators. It's the voices of Minnesotans. And that's why it's so important that we open up our public process, hear from Minnesotans with diabetes. I truly believe it's their voices, their stories, and they're pushing us to take action that will ultimately get us across the finish line. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, State Senator Melissa Wickland, and um, I'm pleased to be here today with uh, Representative Howard. Uh, Minnesotans with diabetes, their families um, have been fighting tirelessly to ensure that everyone has access to emergency insulin. We've made progress in addressing the insulin crisis over the last month, but I agree with Governor Walls. It's time for a public hearing where we can hear from experts, from advocates, and Minnesotans most directly impacted on the two proposals. Um, a public hearing will provide transparency and help us move forward in the most productive manner. 
This can't wait any longer. Together, we can find a solution that includes ideas from the House and the Senate, as well as advocates, and you know that includes DFLers and Republicans alike. I feel we've made progress over the past month with our discussions, and it's been productive in getting a better understanding of, the, of what needs we're trying to um, address. Uh, but now I think we need to move to bringing possible solutions forward uh, for public feedback and um, to develop these possible solutions into a bill that we can take action on. And I'd be happy to answer any other questions. Thanks. Uh, to, you, to either one of you, um, Senator Pratt has just issued a statement. I'll read it to you. It says in part uh, that the public hearings that happened over the interim, the two, uh, didn't uh, result in an agreement. However, he says the working group is making good progress on key issues. We know this issue is urgent, so I'm calling for a meeting this week, presumably of the working group. Uh, what do you think about that? That's great. I reached out to Senator Pratt this morning uh, and asked to connect and about another meeting, and so I'm glad that he wants to meet. Is it your understanding that would be a closed door meeting or a public meeting? I mean, so it sounds I would say, you know, over these last 30 days, that has been a request of the Senate Republicans that we have meetings behind closed doors. And in the spirit of trying to move forward, uh, we've agreed to that. Um, and but what I don't think can last anymore is doing all of our work behind closed doors. Minnesotans with diabetes need to be part of the conversation. Um, so I'm open to a conversation with Senator Pratt about that. But whatever we do going forward must include public hearings from, from our perspective. But is your understanding, I mean, and well, obviously we need to clarify this with him, but when you hear that, it, does that suggest to you a closed door meeting? I'd want to talk to Senator Pratt. Okay. Have they, in these closed door sessions, have, have they discussed the feedback they got at, at, in the Senate's own uh, drug affordability uh, town halls they've been doing? Um, I, I guess I, I know they've talked, discussed having those um, town halls, and um, but I don't recall that we've had specific discussions about feedback they've received. The breakthrough we thought was a couple months ago when Senator Pratt proposed the uh, ex essentially expanding the patient assistance programs that the uh, drug manufacturers already have. Your proposal Friday is 100% fees, so that's uh, it's not. I don't know. I wouldn't clarify. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. What our proposal, what we're proposing to do, is to merge these two ideas. Uh, to take the House Emergency Insulin uh, proposal and merge it with the Senate proposal. So the Senate proposal, you know, asks pharmaceutical companies to provide free insulin. We think that makes sense on the, the long-term uh, insulin affordability front. To pay for the, we do think to pay for the the program itself, the emergency access program that we ought to. Uh, have insulin manufacturers pay for that program for a fee. They, to, just to be clear, you know, this is a problem that our insulin manufacturers have profited richly from, and, and they should be part of this solution. And just one more point, I guess, to, a little bit to the question of where we go from here and meet next. It's great that we continue to meet and talk, but it's time to turn the corner and move the ball forward and talk about what we're going to do and where we stand. That's why the House presented a proposal to the Senate, and we want to hear back from them. We think Minnesotans want to hear back from them as well. So um, what I think is not necessarily helping us move urgently is just talking behind closed doors. We need to show the public where we truly stand on these issues. Yeah, I'm not clear on your, on your proposal. Um, you had told me some time ago that 100% of the cost by the industry probably wasn't something you would, would uh, fall on your sword over. That little bit of money saving from the state might be useful or helpful. This proposal is 100% of the cost would be borne by the industry. Well, this is our proposal, and we, we want to hear from the Senate and truly negotiate. I mean, we're open to a conversation on several elements of the proposal, but it sort of takes a willing partner to negotiate for us to have a path forward. And that's why we presented a, a proposal and why it's important to hear from the Senate. You know, they took that proposal on Friday and didn't truly engage, didn't give us feedback. We anxiously, and we think Minnesotans anxiously await feedback from Senate Republicans about where they stand. Can you, 
walk through a few of the specific changes in this compromised version that differ from your original bill. So the we would utilize the emergency uh, access program similar to the House bill. Uh, but after receiving that short-term supply, basically we would have a handoff to the Senate proposal where we would ask a navigator uh, to connect with that patient, help assess their long-term options. If they're available for public programs, uh, and get them enrolled, uh, but also provide them options to get long-term uh, assistance until as a bridge to the next enrollment period to see if they can have access uh, to coverage, which is really the Senate proposal. So you, you, we take the emergency proposal and connect them to the long-term proposal uh, of the Senate. In broad strokes, that's what we think makes the most sense. And the long-term uh, insulin they'd be receiving would be a supply that would be given to the doctors from the insulin manufacturers as, as the Senate proposed? Uh, so what we would propose, uh, you know, as part of the discussions, we heard a lot about these drug manufacturer assistance programs. And I will say, as an aside, one more reason I think we need to have public hearings is in that room, I think we've heard a lot from Senate Republicans about how well these programs work from the drug manufacturers. Um, and the reality is the experience of Minnesotans are quite different. Uh, uh, but based on those conversations and learning about the patient assistance programs, um, we think if they're going to be utilized, there ought to be some uh, a bar that these manufacturers uh, clear. You know, one of the things that you know the Senate proposal, you'd have to go through the, your doctor. You know, we think you should be able to go through your doctor or your pharmacy. So, so there's a there's a few things that we think uh, could make those programs operate a little better, and thus make the long-term proposal operate a little better. So, I think you just did um, for. Um, a number of patients, the issue of the doctor providing the insulin is is a problem. It sounds like you are you supportive of that part of it that that the doctors could provide it, and also where is the income disparity in terms of income levels? So um, the I think we're open to the that being one option, but we think there should be other options, and it really should be the patients that are in the driver's seat to getting their insulin access. If they choose to go through their doctor, uh, that makes sense uh, for, for that patient. But if they choose to go through the pharmacy, that should be an option as well. And how about the incomes? Are you still at the 50,000 for a single person and 100 for, or if somebody is in you know, a family for 100,000? And where is your understanding of where they are? I mean, are you guys on the same page with those numbers? That's partly why we presented uh, a proposal to understand where the Senate Republicans are. Um, the, and so some of those details, I mean, we, you know, we did give Republicans a little bit of time to react to, and I, and I, wait, to, I wait to hear. From our perspective on the emergency uh, access program, uh, our starting point really is uh, at 600 percent federal poverty guidelines to make sure that we're capturing everybody in a safety net of folks that could be in need of an emergency program. And what, what, would that, what is that figure? Um, so a family of four, you could be earning uh, around 150000 a year. Would there be uh, tracking uh, as part of this legislation? So for instance, I mean, the idea is that the, the, the Senate plans over time is supposed to reduce the need for your plan. Um, would there be tracking to find out how many people are utilizing this? Um, and what the experience of people using the, the long-term Senate thing is. Would there be any tracking? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that reporting is part of all of our, our shared goals in this because we do want to understand um, who is using the program and whether it's meeting their needs. Um, I think we would like to see if there is a um, recommendation that people are using uh, manufacturers, patient assistance programs. We'd like to get the feedback on who in Minnesota is using it um, and, and how well is that um, meeting their needs uh, as well as an emergency program. So I think we'd, we'd include reporting for both. Representative, at this point in the negotiations, is the Senate proposal about free insulin being provided by manufacturers, is that still in, is that in this proposal that you gave to them? Yes. Mm -hmm. They were agreeable to that or have they changed their stance on that at all? I, that's a question for the Senate Republicans, and that's partly why today um, we're calling to do this in, in more public and try to move the ball forward. This is about trying to move the ball forward and do it urgently. Uh, you know, 
at the end of session, closed door meetings didn't get us there on this bill, and I'm not confident that closed door meetings will get us there now. That's why we want to present an offer, give the Senate Republicans offer, an opportunity to react, and to bring the public into the discussion. In those closed door meetings, have you asked them specifically, are they willing to go along with some level of participation by the pharmaceutical industry? And, what, and if so, what have they said? I assume that came up well, in your discussions. I want to respect some of those discussions, but we started from the premise of those four principles that I laid out. Uh, emergency access, long term. We'd also ask the, the pharmaceutical companies to participate and to set something up as soon as we can. Now, I would say some of the conversation uh, does make me wonder if the Senate Republicans want to stick to those four principles, which is, again, is a reason for us to do some of this work uh, more openly in public and for folks to sort of put their cards on the table about where they stand on the policy solutions to address our insulin crisis. And specifically on those four principles, the one that makes you question is whether they want to adhere to the principle of participation by the uh, pharmaceutical industry. Is that one that you have a question on? That's one of them. Okay. Uh, and is that the biggest one here? In other words, if you solve that one, could you potentially have a bill that you could agree on and, and say, hey, Governor, let's call a special session? I don't know if I'd say that. Can you clarify something here? The House plan works off of 600% of poverty. The original Senate proposal was to work off of 400% of poverty. Is, which figure are you using for the Senate part within your compromise proposal? We think the Senate's figures make sense. Do you, this is a potent political issue. I know we don't want to talk about campaign politics here. But it's a very potent political issue for DFL. Do you have people in the broader DFL sphere who don't want to give in too much at this point um, and want to take it to voters? All along, we've been working on this issue for more than a year with advocates and with one singular goal in mind, which is to make sure that no one in Minnesota ever again loses their life because they can't afford the insulin they need to survive. Since we've started working on this proposal, uh, we've had two Minnesotans that we know about lose their life. This is about saving people's lives. And to the extent people want to say that this is about politics, um, in some sense I feel like that's a cover uh, for folks that don't really want to say where they stand and if they want to take action. A good way to make the politics go away on this is for us to do something about the crisis, to solve this problem and to pass a bill. To the extent that there's politics involved, um, it's on us feeling pressure to do the right thing. But our focus is to pass a bill and make sure that no one again loses their life because they can't afford insulin. But you're hearing from advocates who say, I do not want a bill that doesn't have 100% of the cost borne by the industry, and they would rather not have a bill than have you guys compromise on that issue. I haven't heard one person say that. Time for one question. question. Is, were you, uh, I think you were hinting at this a little bit earlier, but is, is it your perception from the people you've heard from in your public meetings that these patient assistance programs aren't really set up for people on maintenance meds that are lifetime meds, uh, that they're like a six month or a year program? I mean, there are, as we've learned about those, these programs, I think there are many gaps uh, to their accessibility for patients. Um, one thing is they are changing. A, a lot of the patient assistance programs have changed even in the last uh, couple years, or a couple months, rather. Um, and some of those changes have been helpful. But the reality of the experience of Minnesotans has been that um, there's a great variable of outcomes. Some programs work differently than others. And there's certainly not a true emergency access that's available for Minnesotans if you absolutely need uh, insulin that day. Uh, that's what we're finding based on the experience of Minnesotans. I just want to make sure that I understand that the cap, the income cap, because it's 400, 600 percent. You guys are talking about 150,000. What would we be eligible if, if, if for a family of four? For just for the emergency piece. The I mean, we, we right, and I think that's because we've we've heard from and we've seen people who have life life situations where they're not able to afford their insulin, but they might be beyond that that 400% um, level. And that was a discussion we had in the summertime working group with the others um, about really we want to make sure that nobody falls through that, um, that safety net of getting a, a short-term supply. Um, and, and so having a higher level for that part makes and, sense. You know, the Republicans 
where are they? I, I think we haven't received feedback okay. on, on that. And what's your understanding of what day this is in terms of the 30-day countdown? Um, well, I know that um, Representative Howard and uh, Senator Pratt and the governor met on October 18th. So, I mean, I, I feel like we, I'm not going to quibble over whether it's day whatever. Um, I think we want to take action and we want action to happen this week. And, um, you know, if they're ready to have another meeting, um, that's something I'm interested in. With the second incarnation of the working group, how many times did you guys actually meet the six of you? Plus, whoever is in the first, I, just to, to, I'll ask about what day it is. What day it is is long past due for us to solve this problem. Uh, we need to, and we can. We have the ability to get together to meet and solve this problem. Uh, sorry, Theo, can you say your question again? Yeah. I, how many times did you all actually meet? By, in the quote unquote behind closed doors over the past 28, 29, 30 days, whatever it is. I think we met four times. Is it realistic to think something could get done by Christmas? There's no reason it shouldn't be realistic. When you look at the House uh, DFL proposal, the Senate GOP proposal, these and the stated goals that everyone says they agree to, these plans should line up. We should be able to work urgently and get this done. What has to give for that to happen? Um, I think we need to, from our perspective, we need to see some earnest engagement from the Senate Republicans on the policy. What do you like? What don't you like? And we need to work quickly and have that conversation. Thanks, All right, thank you.